Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I see a couple of you have already been to Afghanistan. Most of you are civil affairs types. Uh, so I'll try to keep it as, you know, non-military speak for those that aren't. But some of you guys, it's kind of what I know. I've been in the Navy for 17 years now, and it's kind of my way of life. Uh, so as a agricultural line liaison, as kind of part of the collateral duty I had that when I was in Afghanistan, what I'm going to impart on you are some of my lessons learned from my time downrange. So, uh, in summary, pretty much by the end of the lesson, I want you to be able to take away just some of my personal experiences. I don't really want to tell you how to do your job, but I want to help you out uh, when you do go downrange and that you don't have the same experience that I had. And uh, hopefully help you out as being that line liaison if that's your role. I'll do a little bit of a personal intro, pretty much what my interpretation of an agricultural line liaison was and how I did the job. Uh, kind of help you out on how you're going to interact with doing uh, work with Jiroa, primarily the Dale and some of the key leaders. Uh, the U.S. military operations piece to all of that, uh, to include how I worked with civil affairs, some psyops, and we also had SF and ODA there guy, uh, guys there. Uh, then we did U.S. government operations, also USDA and USAID were vast majority of the work I did uh, was in, in partnership with them. And then my recommendations for what I, I think you need to know and some of the resources that could probably help you out. So just personal introduction, introduction to myself, uh, Chief Petty Officer, United States Navy, active duty now for approaching 17 years. Uh, I volunteered to do an individual augmentee assignment to Farah, Afghanistan. Uh, this was my second tour to Afghanistan. I had an amazing time, my very first trip, uh, so I really wanted to go again. Uh, my rate primarily is intelligence specialist, and my primary NEC, or MOS for some of you guys, is to support uh, ground and naval special warfare. So this was going to get me back into my element. It was going to get me back to Afghanistan, which I really wanted more than anything because uh, I, I really enjoyed my first trip. And for the Intel side of the house, it's, it's the home of the great game. And for Intel to go back to Afghanistan and, and to be able to kind of play those roles was just a dream come true for me. Uh, my assignment took me out to uh, RC West, and this is where we kind of had a little bit of a problem because we were under control of RC West. If you've worked with them, you know that that's the Italians and the Spaniards. Uh, but we are also kind of ADCON to US4A. So we had U.S. Forces Afghanistan that we had to talk to and relate with and try to uh, coordinate everything with. Our location was Fab Farah in Farah, Afghanistan. I'll do kind of a drill down here a little bit, uh, a little bit I think, on the next slide to show you that. Uh, my length of tour was pretty much from February to November 2012. So I've been home for a little bit. Things have changed a little bit. I still keep in touch with them downrange. Uh, but our, our train-up cycle, essentially because we were a Navy element, embedded with U.S. Army SECFOR uh, from Alaska, of all places. Uh, it, was, it was six months of training with them at, at Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And then we had a nine-month deployment. So this was a, a grand total of 15-month deployment for the uh, Navy element. I did a lot of my partnership with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, Chris Coyne was who it was at the time. Uh, phenomenal guy. Uh, he, was, he was taking over a, a gapped position, which is very difficult for him. Because the guy before him didn't leave any records, didn't leave any paperwork, didn't leave much of a story as to what he was working on before he left. So Chris had a massive challenge ahead of him as to try to figure out where the previous guy left off, what he was working on, not working on, and uh, where, where we kind of wanted to go with Farah Province after that. And uh, kind of my problem I was running into, I received no training as an agricultural line liaison during my training at Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Again, my primary job was to do intelligence support and mission planning for operations. The agricultural line liaison piece was completely secondary to anything else I was supposed to be doing. So it was a collateral duty. It was whenever I could find time. And this was going to be a challenge because that wasn't the focus of any of my training. I wasn't, wasn't able to receive any type of ADAP training like this. Uh, so this is very phenomenal that I was able to get in touch with Paul and, and some of his colleagues. Uh, and they, they helped me out during that Camp Atterbury training piece. Uh, we also worked with our own civil affairs team that we had embedded with us at, in PRT for RAW. And the way it pretty much broke out is that I focused on the provincial level. That was kind of our agreement. I focused on the provincial level and the provincial dale. And the civil affairs team would, would uh, kind of farm out their guys to the different, different districts. 
and they would take care of things at the district level, and then I would kind of talk and communicate with them to make sure that we were all on the, on the same page. And then if I essentially wanted something to, uh, if I wanted to ch f kind of fact check what the provincial Dale was telling me, I would go on a ride along with a civil affairs guy to go out to that district and really talk to that district leader to see if that ground truth and that ground picture matches what the provincial leader was telling me. And most often, in the very beginning, it wasn't. It wasn't matching up at all. And so it was one of those things I, I really needed to keep engaged with the district leaders, especially some of the, uh, the district leader we had in uh, Pushtarud. Uh, i trying to remember his name now. Ah, kind of forgetting it. Because uh, that guy was absolutely phenomenal. I loved working with him, and I wanted to make sure that we constantly supported him as much as possible. Uh, this man was 72 years old. He had, had, he had received numerous death threats from the Taliban to quit doing uh, the promotion of farmers and telling farmers to quit growing poppy and quit, quit growing the narcotics in Pushtarud district. They threatened him with his life. When he still didn't listen to him, they crushed his collarbone with a rock to try to get to the point across. The man still came to work, received no medical aid, no treatment, still walks to work every single day. That's the guy you got to support. That's the guy that day in and day out, no matter what the Taliban says, he knows he's making a difference, and that's the guy that you got to give all you can to help him out. Okay, even though it was in a very vol kind of a volatile region, in a very tough region for us to go to, that's the guy we need to help. Uh, we also worked with that director of agriculture, irrigation, and livestock, the Dale. That was the vast majority of my focus was working on that Dale. In the very beginning, we had a very corrupt Dale. Old guy, he'd been in the position for, I can't even remember how many decades. Essentially, he just kind of held on to power, enjoyed that power. And then when security and everything else just wasn't going his way, well, I got to make some money out of this. I guess he became corrupt. And this was beginning to stalwart a lot of our efforts. It was stalling us at every turn we were trying to make, every progress we were trying to make. There was always an excuse. I can't do this. I can't do that. There's no security. The roads aren't safe. We can't go there. We can't do this. Ah, oh, it's too hard to get the weed seed. And he was constantly lying to us. And we knew he was pocketing our money. So when our direction came from our, our PRT commander, you will spend absolutely zero U.S. dollars in this province, unless you absolutely have to. That was how we had to approach him. We're not spending a single dime in this province. It's all going to be Afghan money. You know, of course, all eventually it is kind of U.S. money, but that's neither here nor there. That was mostly getting them to teach the Afghan government how to use the Afghan government, to get the provincial deal, to start working with the mail in Kabul, and start working the funds, working the issues, and start doing the paperwork. Again, didn't want to do it, because then he knew he was going to start losing money. So we kind of got our heads together and made kind of a big boy decision. It was time to get the guy fired and put him, get him kicked out of power, which we did. Phenomenal job, and it took a lot of uh, using our channels, using the government, using uh, the provincial uh, governor at the time, we got him fired. So, uh, great, now we need a new guy. And, of course, this guy came in from the outside, a uh, very young guy, uh, fresh out of Herat University, which like, this is phenomenal. So we got a young Dale, fresh out of Herat Ag University. He's got lots of training in agriculture, sustainment, irrigation. Sweet, this is going to work great. Guess what he didn't get training in? Leadership. Leadership, yeah. Or how to use the Afghan government. They don't teach you that in college. They taught him how to grow crops. Uh, so that kind of became our piece now, was now teaching the Afghan government how to use the Afghan government. Uh, but then we had a second piece now that we had to worry about. Now we have a very young college-age student, just graduated, and now he's in a really high position of authority in a province now what do we start running into? Say again? No influence, yeah. Credibility. Now we're going against cultural norms. You have a young man that's going to have to tell elders how to do their job and how to live their lives. So now we have to find ways of still working through Pashtun Wali, start working through Afghan culture and society and, and the, lang the language barriers to help this guy get more credibility and understand that he's got all of these guys. So if I say a Tashkil, you guys know what I'm talking about, a Tashkil? He has all of his workers in a Tashkil. 
And we had to, we had to start telling them, like, look, you, you have to have all these people that are in your Tashkil. If it's filled and they're getting a paycheck, they have to be working. They've got to be doing their job. Best way to do that is start keeping logbooks, pay records, pay stubs. If they're not doing their job and they're not logging in their hours, kick them out. They're fired. They're done. I bet you'll start working then. And that's how he, we got him to be uh, accountable and hold them accountable, is that not so much out of disrespect because they were older than him, he was younger and wiser, you know, or anything like that. It was, this is their job, this is what they're being held accountable for. You either show up to work and you get paid as per the Teshkil, or we're going to find somebody who can. And it started working, and it started happening. Uh, so we, we, uh, we started working through that Dale a lot more. One of the other benefits to having such a young Dale is that he was a little bit more current with the times. When we started talking about working with a minister of, of information and culture, of getting on the radio, of getting on Facebook. He's got a Facebook page now. How many of you guys are following the mail on Facebook now? One. How many of you knew the mail had a Facebook page? Yeah. The, the mail in Kabul has a Facebook page. And you can kind of keep tabs on to what meetings he's going to. And he, they post on the Facebook page for the mail through, his, through uh, his lines of communication, what they're focusing on, where they're going, what they're doing, what projects are, there, are they uh, heading towards. Well, when we told our new Dale about this, he's like, well, I, I use Facebook too. Well, create a Facebook page for the Dale, for Farah Province. And you guys can talk. You don't, he doesn't even have to come all the way out here. You guys can Facebook chat. It's free. Well, well except for internet time at the cafe. But... It doesn't require flights. I, I'm not dependent on security. I'm not dependent on weather. You can sit in your office and you can talk to the mail and cobble. You can work out issues. You can become friends. It's a great time. Post pictures or whatever, right? So we actually started doing this. And I have both of them on my Facebook page to this day just to kind of keep tabs on how things are going on. So think about these things. Try to start thinking outside the box on how you can help spread that word and get that information out as to what's going on in your province. Uh, we had a slightly more permissive province, uh, so some of our traveling was a little bit easier. But being way out west, we are disconnected from everybody else. If some of you guys that are headed to the south and to the east, well, you've, you've got tons of hubs. You've got rotators going around all over the place of how to get from point A to point B or to some fob out in the middle of nowhere. But try to get out to RC West, where you have the Garmseer winds that blow through for four months out of the year, of you know 70 and 80 mile an hour winds, then you're, you're going to have brownouts all the time. Helos aren't going to take off. Vehicles are going to get grounded. Birds are going to get stuck for weeks on end at our FOB. These are things we had to work through and work past. Uh, then we started also having to work through the director of counter-narcotics. Once, once our CA team started working with him, we found out he had no office, he had zero budget, he had no personnel, but yet he was still supposed to do his job in Farah province, the third leading producer of opium in all of Afghanistan. How is this guy supposed to do counter-narcotic operations from his house with no budget, with no personnel? So we had to find ways of kind of helping him to help ourselves. And again, part of that was what you were asking earlier on how can we get them to grow something other than poppy? Part of that was, I think, some of our success during that time, a year that we were there. Massive rainstorms hit the area. Well, what happens to, to poppy when it gets too wet? Fungus, blight, starts to occur. It begins to rot. So we took advantage then, that's where kind of the psyops piece and the riab piece came in, is we got to use that for uh, the farmers to say, for the previous year, all these people that were uh, growing this poppy, it was very haram. We, that those that grew a sinful fruit gained a sinful harvest. That's all they got out of it. But now we were seeing that the wheat farmers, because wheat loves water, so does corn, cucumbers, uh, okra, uh, watermelon, all those crops that loved water, bumper crop that year. Phenomenal. It was great. And so we kind of used that to our advantage to try to get them to say that, like, look, it's a... It's, a, it's kind of an easy win. You got, you're going up against farmers that you're, you're literally telling me all I have to do is grow this thing in the ground, which takes almost no water at all. I have to take some scrapes off the side of it, set that scrape aside. Somebody will come pick me up and give me money for it. 
I don't have to take it to market. I don't have to transport it. I don't have to care for it. I don't have to box it. It's an easy win. How do you fight that? And part of that was having to go through the Afghan culture to, to show them that there are other ways. It's going to be hard work. It's not going to be easy whatsoever. But there's greater security. It's, you're growing crops that are not haram, and you're doing something good for the Afghan people. And that's what we had to go with to try to turn that tide. And so then when I started taking pictures and bringing pictures back of that Pushtarud district, where three quarters of the growing land was then being used for poppy, during that season when we were going out, it was cucumbers, watermelon, uh, sunflowers even, sunflowers everywhere, a uh, bunch of other the fruit and stuff. And it was absolutely phenomenal. And that's how we were able to affect change, is we had to get them to think differently. We had to tell them a different story. Uh, and then, of course, uh, working with ADAP, because I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to be an agricultural line liaison, and I received zero training. So thankfully, through the powers of Google and Bing and other search engines, I found out about the ADAP course being held in Fresno. And I'm stationed in Lamore, California, literally just 30 minutes from here. I was like, crap, why can't I just receive this training, you know, when I was just 30 minutes away? So having to use the powers of the internet once again, got a hold of Paul and his colleagues, and was able to get copies of a lot of the training and the PowerPoints. Uh, was never able to officially attend it. And a couple of the times I had to reach back to, to Paul and the others. It's like, look, uh, I, I've just got boots on ground, and we're doing our Riptoa right now, and they're telling us that PRT for raw promised 50 wells to do some re reverse desertification out in this province way out in the middle of nowhere. And for whatever reason, somebody believed that building 50 wells out in the middle of the desert was gonna somehow reverse all the desertification that is swallowing up these villages. We're trying to tell them that they need ground cover, stuff to grow on the ground, stuff to, to help provide shade, block the wind, and, and kind of keep that moisture in the soil to promote crops. What grows out in Western Afghanistan? I have no idea. Uh, but these guys did. And so that's when I started getting flooded with suggestions, recommendations. Hey, can you, get, can you get your hands on this? Can you get your hands on this? Can you see if some of this is already growing in the area? They were like, great ideas. We'll try to push that. When we started pushing those ideas, they started pushing back. They, oh, no, 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 no. BRT for ah, you promised 50 wells. We want 50 wells. It's like, no, we got that. If we put 50 wells out in the middle of that desert, you're going to pump water up out, of the, up out of the soil. You're going to spread it out over the soil and out over the sands. It's going to go right back into the ground. It's not going to stay there. You're not going to be able to grow crops. You're not going to re reverse the damage that's being done because you've got nothing to hold the water there and to keep it where it's at. You've got to have ground cover. That's how it works. No, 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 no. You promised us wells. We want wells. And then the whole project started falling apart. And so it was... It was good that I was able to reach back to ADAP, get some more recommendations. But other than that, we still would have pressed forward and continued with this, I can't even remember, it was like three or $400,000 project to put 50 wells out in the middle of a desert uh, where they didn't test the water uh, because uh, in southern Farah province, there's a huge uh, kind of perennial lake that's there called uh, Sarab, Sarab Lake. What does Sarab mean in Daria Pashto? No, don't speak the language. Sour water. Yeah, so the water they were going to even be pumping up from the lake and from the tributaries nearby was going to be bad. Is the reason the whole locals had named it Sarab. Is literally, that's what it translates to. So knowing your culture, uh, and, and most of what I'm going to tell you is going to reiterate everything Chris is going to tell you, knowing your culture and knowing the location where you're going is going to have pay off huge dividends. So this is where we are at. Farah province, this gavel looking province way out west, right? So we're bordered by Nimruz, Helmand, Gore, and Herat uh, to the north of us. Uh, where we were at, Fab Farah, smack dab in the middle. And you can kind of see that we, we really basically had three different zones. Of, of agriculture that we were kind of able to influence and, and talk about and worry and manage. So we had 
Purchiman and Gulistan, which were, this is, this is the literal foothills of the Hindu Kush. This is the base of the Hindu Kush, starts right here. And most everything they were growing out there, apples. Uh, honey was a huge thing. Honey harvested from, from beekeeping and uh, doing operations out there was, was pretty much their cash crop out there uh, because the, the environment was good for it, the, the altitude, the crops and everything else were perfect for it. Then we had a central zone that had, uh, you know, kind of bordered on some mountainous regions. You had large flat land. And uh, really, we only had the one Farah River running right through it. So coming from Central California, this was almost exactly like Central California, being in Farah province. They grew almost all the exact same crops. Now in Central Farah and parts of uh, more Western Farah, very closely resembled what I was already seeing living in, in uh, California. Uh, where we have the Kings River here, which is the primary tributary that, that provides water and irrigation, they only have the Farah River, which runs right through the center, goes all the way through Las Juan District, and hits uh, the Surab Lake down there in the south, which then we start getting into all the border disputes with Iran and stealing Iran's water and the fighting that that incurs and uh, all the insecurity that creates. Uh, there's Pushtarud District I was telling you about, this, this tiny little chunk right here. Pushtarud, Kaki Safed, Bakwa, and Gulistan were the most highly contested areas. And if you kind of look at them, because of their terrain-wise, because they were perfect for growing poppy. Too mountainous, too cold here. Way too dry, way too flat, and no real major means of transportation out there. Smack dab in the middle, this middle section was perfect for growing poppy. And that's a lot of what we had to combat. What else can we grow other than poppy that is not really a quick win, but gives a greater or closer to a greater market return for their harvest, vice poppy. So really knowing your terrain, knowing your area uh, was key for us. Uh, so my job as that agricultural line liaison, like I said, my duty was mostly unknown. It was baptism by fire for my very first three months of getting around the province, trying to find out how we we're going to get there. Who am I going to meet with? Is the guy even still on the job? Is he even still alive? Nobody's heard from him in weeks. Uh, then it was progress for about five months, and then it was time for turnover. It's time to get ready for Riptoa, uh, which is probably going to be very similar to what you guys are going to experience. So out of that nine months of being downrange, I think I can probably only say that five months of it, I was actually making any real progress and, and actually getting any real work done. Uh, and then that turnover occurred. Again, my job as agricultural line liaison was a collateral duty. It was also a duty, a collateral duty, for the guy that relieved me. His primary job was to be combat camera. So he's more interested and more worried about taking pictures and kind of getting the good spin on the news of what's going on for our province, not caring so much about what's happening with the agriculture in Afghanistan. Not his training, not his background, and again, it's whenever he could find time to do it. And unfortunately, uh, the unit that kind of relieved us didn't really put a very big emphasis in agriculture in Afghanistan. They didn't really think it was a big deal. They really thought security was the big deal, right? I mean, most of our involvement over there has been on a kinetic side of the, the element. And now we're going over there as peacekeepers and, and troubleshooters and decision makers. And they didn't really see agriculture as being a really big piece to all this. Uh, I was also, a lot of it was doing those KLEs with the provincial officials. That was the biggest piece of it all. And district officials to those lesser degree, like I was talking about, uh, for, for us, the way we divided the, that was to give it to the civil affair guys, and they broke up their civil affairs team into who is going to take what district. And then, you know, if I wanted to know what was happening in what district, so I'd go back to the provincial level, i go talk to that guy. Uh, also, kind of assist in understanding how Jairoa works, having to go against those cultural norms, just like I was talking about. Sometimes you just might run into that. Be prepared for that. And the only real way I can tell you to be prepared for that is to know Afghan culture, know Pashtun Wali, and a Pashtun way of life and the code of ethics they kind of have unwritten. And make sure that you're using that to your advantage. Uh, do not try to go there with a Western mentality how you're going to be a problem solver. 
Uh, one of the biggest things we had to fight was stemming that corruption. Again, they're survivalists by nature. They will do what it takes to live to the very next day. If that means that they've got to skim money off the top so they can make a little bit extra, that's what they're going to do. And it was about teaching Jairo about Jairo. Uh, and more important than anything we hit on was submitting those KLE reports via Sydney. How many of you are familiar with Sydney? Yeah, I was going to say probably all the CA people are, are likely raising their hands. Uh, something I, I would certainly recommend is if you can, all of our reports were unclassified, if you can already get your hands on or get in touch with somebody that's already downrange and already start getting a lead on those KLE reports via Sydney, or if you still have access to Sydney, start doing your read ahead. And where it paid big dividends was I was having a meeting with the director of irrigation for Farah province. And a very, very unusual meeting because he was a brand new guy. He shows up. And as I go to introduce myself and kind of shake hands, and he instantly starts going into his spiel about PRT for all, promise me this, promise me that. I want higher walls for my compound. I want greater security. I want cameras. I want a security guard out there. You guys promised us better wells and irrigation inside the city of Farah. I'm like, hey, let's settle down. First, let's introduce ourselves. I want to tell you who I am. I'd like to know who you are. And then uh, we'll get to your issues. And I'm trying to get him back on track with how an introduction kind of should, to, should be. But most of all, I already knew through previous KLE reports, he was going to try to do that. He was going to try to pull the wool over my eyes and say, you Americans promised me this, that, and the other thing, and you need to deliver. And knowing from the previous KLE reports that that's kind of his tactic, that no, I've read up prior to our meeting, none of these issues were discussed. If you can provide any of these issues in a written format to me, I'd be more than happy to discuss them with you. But I've already read previous meetings from my predecessor. None of these items were already discussed. And suddenly the whole mood of the topic changed. I said, so if these are your concerns, well, then let's talk about them and let's, let's address them. Let's start that now. But I'm telling you, this was never discussed before, so don't try to pull that on me. And if you run into those problems, I'm telling you, one of the kind of best pieces of ammo you can have against it is getting read up with who you're going to meet with, how did you get there, what did you talk about, or what did your predecessor talk about, what promises did the, your previous guy make that he's going to make sure that you have to fulfill? Because a promise is a promise, and they'll hold you to it when you get down there. And if you show up, say, hey, do your intros, and all of a sudden they start shotgunning you with promises that you're supposed to keep during your time there, it will completely throw you off track. And now what are you doing? You're not trying to do sustainability. You're not trying to do projects to make the country better. Now you're trying to fulfill some guy's promises after Rip Toe, who's, who's already going home? He's probably not going to answer your emails about questions. So keep all that stuff in mind. Some of the key interactions with Jairoa, Dale and Narcotics Union. Uh, how about a farmer's union? Do you guys have a farmer's union where you're going? Do you know? I'd look into it. Because they were key players for us, too. Once we found out there was a Farah Farmers Union, it was a matter of trying to help them out also. Because now you have a collective of individuals, all farmers, with the same interests in mind, that want to get together and make something better for Afghanistan, that they pay their dues, they keep log books, and they want to do something better for the future of Farah Farmers. Those are guys you should help support. Give them some training. You know, go to some of their meetings listen to their ideas, see what they have, and then introduce them to the provincial leadership and make sure that they can work together as a team because they're going to be there long after the military branch has left. Uh, provincial governor was very key for us for meeting, meeting with him and being on good terms with him. Again, we wouldn't have been able to get that first director fired if, it, if we didn't have the, uh, the governor on good terms with ourselves. Uh, and then some of the educational institutions. We had, we had to find out that uh, some of the educational institutions have agriculture as part of their training curriculum. Well, how's that training going? What topics are you talking about? Do you need examples of, of what blight on a wheat seed looks like? Do you need examples of what certified wheat seed looks like? Are you getting what you need? What about training materials? I'll show you some of the slides during those visits to the agricultural institutions on what their state was and some of the promises kept and unkept. 
Oh, sorry, go ahead. My understanding is that Grow is very stovepipe as far as each ministry, so mm -hmm. ILG controlling provincial governors and district governors, mm -hmm. Mail obviously controlling the Dales. Yeah. What does the provincial governor do in order to fire the provincial Dale? And then did he have any buy-in or any say in who they hired to fill that position? He didn't. Okay, so getting to your last question. Well, all right, so his buy-in, his buy-in piece to it was mostly going back to that Mail in Kabul of saying that this is what I'm working on, this is what I want done, but the guy that's in position right now, I don't want him there anymore. At that time, it, it wasn't uh, Yunus Razuli who's, who's there now. Uh, the, the previous uh, governor, unfortunately, had to leave due to health terms and wanted to move closer to his family in Kabul. Long story. Uh, he had a lot of power and influence because he was from Farah. He was from that area. People loved him. He had a lot of power and influence. So knowing that, again, we had to use that leverage of power and influence in Afghanistan uh, to get him to go back to the mail in Kabul to bring it right back down to the Dale in Farah province to let him know he was fired. He was out of a job. And he ended up getting another job with a higher pay somewhere else in Afghanistan. But I personally didn't care because now he was out of my province and now I could start doing great things. Uh, he didn't, uh, the governor didn't have a say as to who, who was going to go into that spot. Uh, as far as I know, you know that, that went through other separate channels that I you know, really wasn't privy to myself. I was just something that I kept engaged with the uh, deputy, deputy director of the Dale to ask him, hey, have you heard who's, who the next guy is? Have you heard who the next person is? How's this coming? Have they picked somebody yet? Are they doing interviews? He's like, no, I think sometime soon, sometime soon. Inshallah, we'll have somebody. I'm like, okay. I uh, I think we were, I think turnaround was maybe two to three weeks. It really wasn't too bad. I I was afraid that on, I was really afraid that the deputy director was going to kind of get stuck with a position. He didn't really want it. Uh, he was a very older gentleman. He just kind of was happy with his deputy director position. Did not want to be the director of the Dale. So uh, we really lucked out with getting uh, you guy. Who do you see here? Manan Matin, awesome guy. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a question. Uh, so for the U.S. government side, again, was USAID and USDA. A lot of it was USDA, was working with them to make sure that, that uh, my ideas for where, where I think we should be going with the future of Farah province kind of match with them. Because again, USAID and USDA were going to be there long after myself, and I can only fill a little bit of the gap as to what happened from the previous USDA representative and what happened when the new guy came in. I could only have, fill in that little bitty piece of what I knew. Uh, for the military, it was the civil, civil affairs team I could talk about. Uh, we did have two VSO platforms that were uh, in two separate districts, but last I've heard, those have now shut down and they've now collapsed into the FOB. VSOs are closing up if you're familiar with those. Uh, so a lot of our work was also to make sure that if I was, you know, as Chris was saying, going into their battle space, if I was going into Kaki Sifet, if I was going into Push to Root, where the VSO was at, it was something I, I wanted to give them a heads up that I'm headed their way. So if you guys are going to be doing a meeting in the area, or if you're going to be doing something kinetic in the area, just give me a heads up, because I want to know beforehand if my meeting's going to go south before it even gets started. Uh, for your uh, US-4A animal vet. Now, this is something we kind of found out about uh, through calling around when we tried to, to try to find a way of kind of developing or at least get something started in Farah province for veterinary services. Uh, we found out there was a vet in, up in Herat who worked for US4A whose uh, real kind of only job was to take care of the dogs for the canine units that were uh, stationed there at Stone and at Arena. That was really his only job. Uh, but he had a lot more capabilities. So we working through US-4A and parts of RC West, said, hey, can we get this guy on a rotator, bring him down to Farah for like maybe a week, and provide free education and training on uh, diseases, vaccination, how to recognize diseases, what to do about them, how to separate them from the herd, you know, and when it's time to put them down. You know, all these things. Uh, artificial insemination was a very big question of theirs, which gets back to refrigeration and everything else. Uh, so these were, these were things way out of my realm, but the USDA uh, representative's realm. We had to really find ourselves a vet somewhere, somewhere in the country. So when we got permission to fly him down for about a week at a time, 
Uh, we got to give him a tour of this is what we're looking at, this is what we're working with, what can you do for us? So, oh yeah, I've already got tons of slides of, of stuff like this. Some is going to have to be built and modified and honestly dumbed down because you're going to really be talking to farmers that mostly can't read, are not going to have uh, you know, the veterinary lingo that uh, he, you know, he may be talking with. You know, we're using $5 words just to explain what anthrax looks like on sheep and cow. So uh, bringing him down, and he brought all of his PowerPoints down. We use our interpreters and our linguists to get those translated into Daria and Pashto. And then uh, we worked it out to bring him back down to actually facilitate that training. We brought several of the, the uh, senior ranking members of, of farmers and, and some of the co-ops and stuff on to uh, attend that training. I'll show you pictures of that later. Uh, then we had our SEC4. I really had to work with our SEC4 tremendously. Uh, so we had, we had Alaskan National Guard guys, very phenomenal, but almost half of them were literally Eskimos. They really were from Yupik tribe. And as I'm giving them the read ahead of what Farah province is like is to anticipate that we will be there during the summertime. You will experience temperatures upwards in the range of 130 degrees for about six weeks, and then it'll slowly trickle off. And one of them raised his hand, and he said, Chief, Chief, the hottest I've ever been was 72 degrees once. And I was like, oh my God, you guys are going to have to hydrate like it's nobody's business. Otherwise, you're going to drop like fries, and we're going to have heat stress injuries. And I can't worry about somebody dropping out while I'm trying to do a KLE, okay? Second piece is that all of our training, Camp Atterbury, you know, the Army National Guard, what was their training? Kinetic. Go to the fight. Get them, get them, get them. Suppress the enemy. Suppress the threat. Well, that's good. That's not what I'm doing during a KLE. I'm going to a meeting that I want to be friendly, non-hostile. And so when we were in a slightly more permissive environment, we kind of had to switch out of our 1151s and our RG31s and our RG33s and now start driving up-armored SUVs. And they'd never received training in that. They had no idea how to drive an up-armored SUV. Does anybody else have experience in that? No? Okay. Totally different handling char characteristics from a big boxy home V1151. And you're definitely not sitting nearly as high as an RG31 or a 33. And there's no turret. So... When they say tactical trunk monkey, that's what he is. Your gunner is now in the back of the trunk of the up-armored SUV. So if you need him, guess what he's got to do? He's got to open a 35-pound door of an armored SUV and get to work. So it's a wholly different environment when you go to the KLEs. Now we had to start completely rethink how we're going to do these meetings because now we're going into civil places. And just like Chris was saying, what happens to the population when you're rolling through town on an RG31 or an RG33 and your gunner up there is, is sweeping for threats? What's that do to the populace? They think something's going to happen. And, th and when we started realizing, and, and this is from my previous time in Afghanistan, I had to tell them, like, look, we're, we're going it's, to, it's safe. It's good. If something happens, we'll handle it. But we're going to take the up and SUVs in town. And, and we're going to dismount. We're going to walk to the meeting location. We're going to get to the meeting location, and I'm going to downgrade all my gear. I'm going to take all my gear off. I'm not wearing a helmet. I'm not wearing any body armor. I'll have my sidearm with me, and I'll have my rifle next to my, my side. But other than that, you guys are the security force. You keep me safe outside the building by Pashtun Wali and Pashtun Code. I am now his guest. He is responsible for keeping me safe, and I'm going to hold him to that. They're like, Chief, are you nuts? Are you kidding me? Why, why would you take off your body armor? I was like, look, if he's going to show up to this meeting with no body armor, no bodyguards, no firearms himself, how am I supposed to tell him that there's enough security in this province and there's enough security in this district that he can go out and help the farmers if I'm not even willing to do that myself? That paid huge, huge dividends in the end. When they would see that, when I would show up to a meeting when I finally arrived, I took all my gear off, I set it all aside, I put it over there for my own personal protection. Obviously, everyone's read their green on blue incidents reports. I still have my sidearm to my side uh, and my, my primary down on the ground, but that's not what I was there for. I was there to do a meeting with another civilized human being that was responsible for my security, and that's what I held him to. And I, if I recommend that if you're 
environment is uh, safe enough for you to do that, if you feel comfortable enough with, with that, I would recommend that for you also. That is entirely your decision. It's only my recommendation. For the NGOs, they varied by location, uh, and it kind of varied all throughout where we were at in Farah province. Uh, when kind of the startup of our training, we heard there were somewhere of 30 some NGOs in the province. And when I started doing my research and I found the ARAYU publication, R-E-E-U, -E are you guys familiar with that one? Afghan Research and Evaluation Unit. It's a publication written by Afghans for Afghans, and in the very back they list how to contact, phone call, email every NGO in your province, and even some of your districts. So I got a hold of them to find out who they were, what they were working on, and kind of doing some of that research all ahead of time. So I made sure that uh, if, if somebody's over there, like uh, UNHCR, they're the ones responsible for doing the countermine and demining operations. It's kind of one of those things I wanted to know that before I went out into a field to inspect the wheat or the corn, I wanted to make sure I wasn't going into an active minefield anymore. You know, that, that they'd already cleared that area that, you know, it was, but the perimeters are still hot zones. Uh, and also because of that security situation, vast majority of NGOs have left. There, there are still quite a few in the area, but keep posted with ARAYU and everybody else to find out who they are, what they're working on, and make sure that you're not button heads and that you're not doubling up your efforts when uh, you, know, you can have more success. And more than anything, keep with the NGOs because they are going to be there long past 2014 when the vast majority of our kinetic element and everybody else has already done their rip, rip and they've already gone home. So my recommendations for you, know and understand your location. So when I, when I found out I was on an IA to Afghanistan, the very first thing I did, I worked through the chain of command find out who I had to call to find out exactly where I was going. That's kind of the intel side of me and, and, and just the information junkie I am. I wanted to know exactly where I was going, what time of year I was going to be there, and that's when I started doing my research into Farah province and what PRT Farah was. I uh, also know that you know, almost three quarters, maybe a little bit more of, of the farmers in, in Afghanistan are sustenance farmers, and that's, that's what they're there for. They are only going to grow the crops that will guarantee them a livelihood and to live through that year so that they'll have something for next year. That's what they're focused on. That's what they're worried on. So growing that opium or growing the poppy to harvest opium, processing the heroin, everything, if that's their cash crop because that's what gives them enough money to live year through year, that's what they're going to focus on. You're going to have to fight that. Uh, again, like Chris said, water is life. And... For where we were at in western Afghanistan, we didn't also have to worry about how we were affecting for all farmers. We also had to worry about blowback from Iran, bordering Iran, that if our farmers during drought season were going to be using too much water, it's going to get through Iran. They're going to complain to their farmers. Iran's going to complain to Afghanistan. They're going to come back to Farah province. Why are you cutting off so much water that's leading into Iran? And then that transportation piece, which Chris already covered, the bumpy roads, uh, understanding of, you know, just loading stuff up in the back of the cars, as some of you guys have witnessed. Uh, having to try to overcome those traditional norms, but the, really the only way you can actually overcome them is be familiar with them yourself and what you might have to be overcoming and understand why somebody might be making one decision or another because of an influence of traditional norms. Uh, knowing your climate and seasons, that's another huge thing. Yeah, for wherever you're going, you should already, I would recommend, already have a diagram of what your growing season looks like, what your harvest season looks like, what your planting season looks like for where you're going. Because you can't decide to start doing wheat seed distribution at the time when they're supposed to be planting wheat seed. You already should have been doing that four or five months ago. If your predecessor wasn't doing that, you're already behind the power curve. Now you have to start going into a little bit of more crisis management mode of what are we, what are we gonna do next? You have to start thinking about these things. Read your previous KLE reports. Uh, we used radio, rehabs, and then social media if you have it available. Highly recommended. Uh, cell phone and cellular networks are, the, are pretty much a, an awesome way of getting communications around to farmers and, and the local populace. But almost everybody has a radio in their home, uh, whether it's the hand crank radios that, you know, that we, you know, we've been providing and handing out by ISAF, uh, or being able to use that rehab, yeah, being able to use that rehab, that radio in a box, 
to be able to get the message out about, about the growing seasons, about what market prices are right now, what you can get for you know, a, a good pomegranate uh, in Farah City and, and everything else. Use that to your advantage, uh, especially because the communication systems are already in place. You don't have to build those. All you have to do is to get those that are in charge to start thinking outside that box and how they can get their message out in uh, now's the time to plant seeds. Now's the time to start doing your irrigation. You know, get them, get them to think. Josh, uh, the, I, I believe you mentioned in the previous uh, session that uh, you were able to use this pretty effectively, right? To yes, the yeah. Show, maybe oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, right before I left, we, we started doing that where we were bringing the uh, Dale on board our, onto our FOB, and uh, we had a call-in show for him. And so actual farmers were calling in saying, hey, look, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my crop right now, and I've got this black stuff growing on the wheat right now. What is that? He's like, well, if you can describe it to me, how did it get there? Is it all over the crops? He was able to answer their questions immediately over the phone. He was immediately able to reach out, not just to that farmer, but now any other farmer or any other civilian that was listening to that radio broadcast, now they could start thinking about that also. He never had to leave other than to go from the Dale's office, which is in town, to come to our FOB, which is just outside of town. Uh, so there was a bit of a security concern in that, that regard. But uh, he didn't have to go out and try to stop at every single farmer's plot to see what was wrong. They could now call in to him, and he could listen to their problems and help them out. So that, was, that was a very big win. Yeah. That, that doesn't want to get out from the office and go out to the field and visit farmers, but yet you have this issue of connecting the government to the people. Right. I think I think this uh, kind of mass media offers a real interesting right. opportunity for not only the Dale but for yourselves. Right. And part of this was to work through the the Minister of Information and Culture and the Director of Communications was working through them to to essentially as we're going to hand this off to them. We had to make sure the infrastructure is in place and, and those line liaisons that were taking care of that had that piece of the puzzle. That could be a nice icebreaker with the Dale because he can look good to his people yeah. without oh, yeah. going physically out there for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons, which may be very, very real for him. Right. It, uh, it helps build up his capabilities and his connection to his people. Definitely. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I forgot about that one. Uh, making those small incremental changes are going to mean a hell of a lot more than making large, large changes where you're trying to go for that really big win. Uh, you might affect a small populace. Go for small changes. It's going to take a lot longer, but it's going to pay off longer in the, in the end. And use your reach back. And know that there are still people, some in country and some back in the U.S., that are still willing to help you out that if you have questions, if you're getting, uh, getting pushed back, or if you're getting stalled somewhere, that there are still resources back here in the United States through email. I'm sure Paul and ADAP colleagues will more than help you out. And then, uh, man, Semper Gumby, always be flexible. I got a question. On that radio show, how did you, uh, how did the populace know that there was going to be an individual on the radio? Did you guys put out something, flyers out, and say, hey, look, we're going to do this, we're going to do this on a weekly basis? Or SMS. Pardon? SMS, sending a text message. You can you can yeah, send them out in mass. Yeah. From previous workshops or so, they got lists of farmers and their telephone numbers. So so you, you right. Advertise. Yeah. Right. It was through advertisement that it was it was going to go on. And we only had to do this once or twice because we were hoping through success that it would be word of mouth after that, because that's when we could get each individual you know villager to start talking to the other guy and say, hey, you know, have you been listening to the broadcast? They were talking about this. I'm personally not growing any pomegranate, but you are. He might be able to help you with your problem so during their. Uh, no. It was mostly periodically. It was it was uh, baby steps. We trying to want to keep it uh, plain and simple in the beginning, and of course the Dale was also working on numerous other issues. You know, still trying to get it indoctrinated into how to be a Dale. Uh, but more than anything, we wanted the farmers to know that he was there and he was there to help them out and he would definitely listen to their problems. They didn't have to come into town. He could just call in. They could just call in during the radio show if they had questions. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah. I just wondered how you got, you know, people to be able to kind of 
And I think, yeah. I think it could be more strategic. I think it was a, like an experiment, as you say. It was, but it yeah. Was much more strategic for your deployment period that you put that as a as a priority. The, the mass media, we've learned a lot of messages here that mm -hmm. need to go out. So you look at your deployment time, as you said, give a heads up a month or two ahead of time. That yeah. Did the individuals that gave you the numbers, I mean, were they reluctant to give you the phone numbers? The to they didn't give us any numbers. Actually, that was actually, that was all through the Dale. Oh, so the Dale that was the Dale, yeah. working through Jiroa and working through the Director of Communications and Information and Culture to, to make that happen. Okay. We That was hands-off for us. We didn't want really any involvement. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering how, how, they, you know, how they acquired the information. Yeah, some of that was through the radio broadcast where we said, you know, during this time frame you can call into the call in on this line and you know we had an interpreter available just in case uh, because um, Abdul Manamatin spoke very good English uh, very good English to where I, I never really needed an interpreter uh, my Dari and Pashto is, is pretty limited and I never ne needed an interpreter with him which is phenomenal but I think he I'm pretty sure yeah he, he really only spoke Dari and so uh, if someone called him with Pashto then you know, he, was, he might be a little unfamiliar with that but other than that it was kind of coordinating the linguist piece to it but we try to keep it as much as their project as much as possible. We provided the location the first couple of times, and then after that, it was Afghan government working through Afghan government. Yeah. So pictures from the field. Uh, this is uh, the Army captain down from Herat, like I was talking about, uh, providing training and, and some education uh, for some of the Farah farmers to, to talk about the veterinary supplies, injections, medicine, how to recognize problems and sickness, what to do about it, how to prevent it. Uh, very, very popular last I heard, and I'm not sure if this is still ongoing, something I'm interested in. Uh, USAID project was to build that Farah Agriculture and Veterinary Educational Institute. It was probably a pretty phenomenal project. They, they built the facilities, they built them hoof houses, they gave them property, and they got them started with some of the educational products. And they said, here you go, take it, run with it. But had no buy-in or no involvement from the director of education. So it wasn't in the budget, and it wasn't upkept. So as you can kind of see, it's in a bit of a disarray. And we'll kind of go through that a little bit more. Uh, one of the things they wanted to try, uh, trellises, grape trellises. Because often, especially places like Helmand and, and Kandahar, how are the grapes grown? Yeah, on the, on the ground or, or, you know, a, a mound, you know, and, and then it's the vine just kind of laying out over it. We're like, oh, okay. So somebody said, well, let's, let's build trellises, and they grow them up off the ground, now up in the air. Okay, well, here you go. Here's your trellises. Start growing some grapes. They had no idea how to do that. No idea how to take care of them. You can see in the picture, there's a couple of them that are trying to thrive in this. Uh, but you can see their flood type irrigation and some canals that they have run in here. Uh, and it just wasn't quite working. That was one of those projects of, all right, so where's the deficiency? Is it materials? Is it knowledge? Is it the reading materials? So this was where our, our meetings with the director of education and the, uh, the kind of the, the principal uh, of who's running the, the schoolhouse on trying to find out where the discrepancy was. There's our up armored SUVs I was talking to you about. There's those uh, nice hoop, hoop houses, $200,000 project. Here's your hoop houses. It's kind of like a little greenhouse. Keeps the moisture in the soil, protects it from the elements and from birds and from pests somewhat. Uh, here's your hoop houses. Grow. Okay, what they didn't explain to them is that the plastic covering on the hoop houses are good for three years. After three years, that plastic material is going to have to get replaced. That part wasn't explained to them. They just kind of assumed and figured, well, they'll kind of figure that out, and surely they'll put it in the budget, right? That's what any common, knowledgeable person would do. Well, no. Well, you gave it to us, so now we need replacement materials. Oh, no, no, that wasn't part of the original agreement. The original agreement was we were going to give you hoop houses, you were going to use them for education and training, and then that's it. So replace them. Oh, we didn't put it in the budget. Now you've got to wait a whole other year before the budget approval process goes through, before you can put it in the budget and then find supplies and a contractor. Out of curiosity, did they actually have that plastic in the local bazaar? No, they didn't. It had to be brought in from Kandahar, if I remember right. 
and so now you're worrying about transportation issues. You're worrying about security, you know, and, and everything else. And so this is where they wanted the U.S. to get involved again. Hey, we need your help. You guys started this. We want it up and running again. And so now we had to help them learn the process of working through Gyro and through Director of Education to get it in the budget to fix it. What's this? Perfect. Two million dollar project to instantly build a massive open air market. It's approximately 300 yards long, so to speak. Massive open air market. Looks like it's being used. Why is that? It's in the wrong place, for one. I'm sorry? Uh, they did a little bit for actually doing the assembly and everything else. You know who they didn't involve? It was the Farah mayor. They didn't involve him. Come to find out, the Farah mayor owns three of the bazaars inside the city of Farah. They didn't let him know that they were going to be building this massive open-air bazaar on the outskirts, the edge of Farah city, thinking if we build it right next to a highway, we're going to have tons of trucks and traffic that can come straight into the open-air market, it's going to fill up. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be beautiful. We're going to take him from this dirt, no electricity, crazy packed marketplace to a massive open air wholesale market like that. Let's do it. So they did it. It was open one day. One day. It was so popular. Every single stall was filled on both sides of this thing. Not only was it so popular, the road leading to it was completely packed and jammed with people that couldn't get in. There was no room for them. So they had to start selling next to the road. The people absolutely loved it. The mayor shut it down. Now he's losing money. Now he's losing business. Nobody let him know that this project was going to be going on on the outskirts of town. So he shut it down. And last I heard, that's exactly how it still looks to this day. It's been in sitting like that for approximately three years now. Never been used other than one day. Now, it's, now they're trying to go through the process, getting the mayor involved, getting him to have a buy-in to it, getting the generator up and running, getting the rest of the repairs made after years of neglect now, and bring this back online to prove how good it will be for the, the city and the people of Farah if we can get this going. But now you've got to work against the system. Okay, a couple of the resources. If you don't already have them, I highly recommend that uh, Arrayu publication, the A to Z Guide of Afghanistan. It literally is that. Uh, if you want some other online resources on just kind of read it up on, on what's happening and what's going on, it uh, would be the Afghan Analyst Network and USA to Afghanistan. Check on them and, and what they're working on, what they're doing. And if you're just out of curiosity, go to the Mail's, Mail's Facebook page. Uh, for Afghanistan. You don't have to friend them because they're obviously not going to know who you are. Uh, but just kind of see what they're up to and what they've been posting and, and what they're saying and what they're working on. Just something to, uh, to start getting a read ahead of, of where you're happening. And like for Farah, we, our guy now has a Facebook page. Uh, maybe something to look into for where you're going to. Something to think about. Okay. So now is my last little piece. One little thing I love to do just because uh, I am definitely a, a, a cultural, uh, embedded kind of guy, and I love the Afghan culture, the language, the people, the history. I love it all. I also knew when I was going there, I was going there not only for security and stability, that as a line liaison, I'm going there as a problem solver. And I'm going to have to go over there and make, help make decisions and help them solve their own problems. Uh, but some of that I had to understand the Afghan culture. So I kind of get you in this little critical thinking, structured analysis course piece uh, I want you to understand that some of your ideas and some of your decisions on how you think you can make uh, something better for Afghanistan may not be received very well. Some of the decisions they have may make absolutely no sense to you whatsoever, but will surprisingly work. So part of that is this structured analysis course and, and some examples I want you to just kind of think about. All right, so first example. Uh, we have an explorer who's on an island all by himself. And he's got a flashlight and a canvas bag with him. Now, he's got a set of caves that he wants to explore to check out the hieroglyphics and, 
and some of the cave paintings that are inside. A downside is when he gets inside the cave, he's afraid that if he gets inside there, he's going to get lost. And if his flashlight breaks or goes out, he's not going to find his way out again. So real quick, let's brainstorm some ideas on how to solve that problem. Not, not to get lost in the cave? Correct. Yeah, you take something and walk your way in. Okay. Strings? String rope. String rope, maybe from the canvas bag or something? Canvas bag or marker. Okay. Marking, like rock. Okay. Great. Good examples. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so the, uh, the second problem, second, second problem you need to come to solution for, right? So there's a tribal priest uh, who, who normally takes care of a golden idol. And part of that is every year he's got to travel downriver and collect tributes from all the villagers. And the tribute pretty much has to come to the same weight as the golden idol. And, you know, just out of all fairness, he normally brings a scale with him. But this time he's gone down the river with the idol now, and he's forgotten his scale. So how is he now going to go to each village and get them to pay a proper tribute for the same weight as that idol? A what? A fulcrum scale. Fulcrum scale? Okay. It's kind of tough, isn't it? Maybe they have a scale. Oh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Some sort of scale, right? Okay. That's good. So I'll let you know that you have given the exact same responses as every class before you. All right? Now, why is that? Because for Westerners, the very first problem is a very easy solution. Most of us all grew up with the story of Hansel and Gretel. You know the story of Hansel and Gretel leaving breadcrumbs going through the forest so they don't get lost. That, growing up with that story and having that in your knowledge has kind of, you know, influenced you subconsciously on how you make your decisions because that's how you were raised. That was a part of your raising and your upbringing and has now subconsciously affected your decisions. Chinese students, however, on the other hand, they have absolutely no idea how to solve that first problem. They don't know. They didn't grow up really with the story of like Hansel and Gretel uh, in their folklore or anywhere in their culture. Now, what about the second story? It's a little bit harder. Most Westerners always come up with, well, build a scale, make a scale, find a scale. They stick to the scale story because that's their solution because that's what was introduced into the problem. Chinese students, on the other hand, well, it's an easy fix. It's an easy solution. Because they grew up with a folklore and a story of a king who required tributes from all the lords of his land. And every day or every year when those tributes came in, he would kind of weigh them out to see which one of his lords uh, gave him the most. One of his lords once gave him an, a an elephant. So he wanted to know how much the elephant weighed, but he didn't have a scale. His son came up with an idea. What if we put the elephant in a boat, make it sink, mark that water line, and then take the elephant out, put all the rocks inside that boat till it hits that water line, weigh the rocks individually, and now you have a solution to your problem. So while it's very unconventional for Chinese students, their initial answer to the second problem was to take the idol into the boat, mark the water line, take the idol out of the boat, now fill that boat with tribute until it hits that water line again. It's easy as that. So when you start thinking of ways of you know, trying to come up with decisions on how to solve some of these problems in Afghanistan and how you're going to help them make their decisions, understand that subconsciously your upbringing in a Western society is going to influence and it's going to be different than some of the decisions that they're going to come up with as Afghans growing up in Afghanistan. Now, when, I, when I lived and worked in Hawaii, we had that saying, you know, we grew here, but you flew here. Exact same thing. You're flying there downrange to go boots on ground, to be decision makers and troubleshooters. But just understand that because of cultural differences and beliefs and norms, some of your problems or problem solving ideas may not be all that popular. Okay? Does anybody have any questions? All right. That concludes. I'm done. That's our team.
part of that for us. It, it became into reading into the process of, of the IDLG, like you were talking about, and reading up on, on how uh, those, those fiscal funds are decided as to who gets what, and to make sure that there is a process. Uh, when we first got there, there wasn't a, a process in the province as to what kind of a budget they were going to have and how they were going to spend it, how it was going to broken out, get broken out, what projects were going to receive what priority. They didn't have that when we first got there. They didn't really need it. Uh, SERP, yeah, SERP funds were there. SERP funds were always available. Yeah, so we, we cut off that, you know, avenue of approach for them, and now, now they had to learn how, how to use the Afghan government, how to use those funds, how much of, you know, they were going to get to spend, you know, on an annual basis, and then what was going to be a priority. And then that's where we had to influence some of their decisions as to, look, that's right, that, that your ideas for doing agriculture this time of year are a really bad idea just because of where your water table sits, the location it's at, all these other things. So uh, we really did have to influence a lot of their decision making on how to kind of rack and stack their priorities. Uh, but more than anything, we wanted them to come up with their ideas on the budget, how much it was going to cost, and who it was going to go to.